I, I started my career cloning stem cells about uh, 1967 is when I started. So I was uh, about 45 years ago uh, cloning these stem cells that people are just beginning to talk about in the last few years. Uh, uh, it, it was such profound research that I had I, I, I had tenure at the university and and the results of the research uh, caused me to uh, to resign my tenure position and walk out because I knew from the research that what I was teaching medical doctors about how cells work uh, was completely wrong. And uh, so I, I felt out of integrity. I said, I can't teach this anymore. So I left. Wow. And that was that was your quantum leap. I mean, that's what many people are doing right now, stepping in this, what they really believe is the truth and is authentic and aligned with their their purpose. Yes, absolutely. And this is why this is such an exciting time, because we are in an evolution. But what's interesting is because when we talk about evolution, normally we talk about uh, one organism changing its biology and turning into something else. And it's sort of like, this is an evolution not in, in our physical biology. This is an evolution in our consciousness. And, and it's basically, it's not the evolution of, of us as individual humans. We already did that. We are already here. It's the evolution that we recognize each human being is the equivalent of a cell in the body of a super organism called humanity. So as much as I look at my body in the mirror and I say, oh, there's one human looking back, Bruce Lipton, one organism, and I go, that's a misperception because if you could see with a microscope, you're made out of 50 trillion cells. It's the cells that are the living entity. So a human being by definition is a community of 50 trillion cells. Well. Once we evolved as that level of the community, the next level of organization is where we become cells in the body of a larger thing called humanity. And this is why governments are falling apart, national borders are falling apart, because this is a change where all people have to recognize we're all part of the same organism. Yeah. And that when we fight each other, it's the same as inside your body if you have what we call autoimmune disease, which is by definition self-destruction. So what we have to do is realize that the cells can't fight each other. We have to come together in a harmony of we are one humanity. And once everybody is understood of the fact that we are all part of the same community, there's a great opportunity for a, a wonderful evolutionary shift where the concept of war and violence could be a, a historical document and nothing new anymore, nothing more of that again. Yeah, what are those, tell us more about those, the, the, the scientific evidence of that. Yes, um, when, when we look at evolution, we, we usually look at like a Darwinian evolution. We say, well, an organism was very simple here. And then through evolution and evolution and evolution, we evolved all these organisms from this little primitive one. And so we just look at evolution as one continuous unfolding process. But that is a mistaken perception as well for this reason. Evolution has start and stop points. And when it gets to the stop point, it restarts again and uses the same pattern. So the first organisms, that little primitive group that was down here at the very bottom were bacteria. And we see bacteria as this free living little primitive cells. And it turns out our studies reveal that bacteria live in community. They communicate with each other. There, there's a whole web, uh, an internet, so to speak, among all the bacterial cells because they keep each other informed about what's going on in the world. So there's a sharing of awareness. That sharing of awareness, some of it is viruses. That's a way of communicating. That's held the cells together. But what evolution found was it couldn't make a smarter bacterium. And so to make more intelligence, what it did is it brought a whole bunch of bacteria together in a group, in a community, and put a membrane around it. And these bacteria live in a little tiny membrane, and we call that the next level of evolution called the amoeba. The amoeba is a complex cell made out of primitive bacteria who cooperate together. 
So we have single cell bacteria form a community, which then becomes a single amoeba. Well, now these amoebas, which are communities of bacteria, they start uh, evolving and then they start to come together in communities themselves. So now we have communities of amoebas, which each amoeba is a community of bacteria. So we had a single cell and then a community. And then the community became a single cell and then that formed a bigger community, which is us. Then we evolved and now, okay, so we've maxed out our awareness, but how do you make more intelligence? The evolutionary pattern is always, first you create the entity, then you create the community of entities. So where are we? We are in the level of becoming aware that we are not a whole bunch of individual people as we see it. We are one thing called humanity. And when we come together in the community of humanity, that will complete this evolution on this planet. Mm -hmm. Because what the next level of evolution is, our planet becomes a cell and then hooks up with the other planets, which are other cells, mm -hmm. and we form an intergalactic superorganism. Mm -hmm. So we're uh, on a step-by-step -step thing. So the, the biggest jump we have to do right now is let go of the past vision of our separateness and our individuality, which is a Darwinian belief. Remember, the Darwin theory said that evolution is driven by a struggle for survival with the survival of the fittest. Yeah. So in our vision, it's like, oh, the best human is the evolution of humanity. And sort of like, nature doesn't care about the best human. Nature says, what are humans as a group doing to the garden called Gaia? And so if nature was gonna have a court, which is <laughs> it's having right now because we're going extinct, and this is a scientific reality. And why are we going extinct? Well, this is not the first time. There have been five times in the history before where life got wiped out essentially and then started over again. Tell us about called, those. Those are called mass extinctions. Mm -hmm. And so if you go back, you look at the, uh, the fossil record, and you see, well, there's evolution, and then everything got like destroyed and then it started over again at another level and another level five times. The five previous extinctions have been due to things like comets or asteroids hitting the earth, uh, destroying the environment and then wiping out. Are life. we including Atlantis? Well, there's something happened back there as well. So again, these are the mysteries because we, we don't have enough data and our, um, our vision has been really with blinders. Yeah. <laughs> And now we're expanding our vision. So why, why it's important now is that you know a mass extinction occurs when you lose large numbers of species very, very rapidly. Well, scientists have recognized we are now in a mass extinction. We are losing species of organisms on this planet at record numbers in history that has ever been done. And this cause is a lot closer to home, this extinction, than the previous ones with, you know, comets, asteroids, whatever it was. This extinction, according to science, is due to human behavior. Yeah. That we are undermining the garden, yeah. the, 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 the biological ecosphere. That we're causing big holes in that network and it's causing a collapse of the system. Most importantly, as we talk about this extinction, like, oh, we're going to lose the lions and all these things. It's like, yeah, and we're going to lose the humans <laughs> as yeah. well. That's part of the extinction. So we have a choice. This is a choice point right now. We have been creating the extinction, and it's only through our awareness and our changing of the way we live on this planet that there's an opportunity to survive and make it through this extinction. So this is a choice point. Yeah. And, and this is really so cool for this reason. Evolution is going to be a participatory process. We have to participate. It's not an accident. It's not that we go home and turn on the television and fall asleep and then we wake up in the next morning and go, oh, a whole new evolution. It's like, no. Mm -hmm. This is an evolution where we make a difference based on the way we are living in regard to the other people and regard to the ecosphere. Mm -hmm. And this is a wake up call because science says, look, 
like within 30 years, think about this. I mean, it's mind boggling. Within 30 years, the fish that we depend on in the ocean will be gone. Imagine a planet Earth with all these oceans and no big fish in it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not a, a, that's not a like a fantasy. That's a scientific reality, mm -hmm. and that's thirty years. So it's like this wake up call is coming. We have to make a response to it, and we have to change the way we live on this planet, and we have to treat each other differently, and most importantly, treat our Mother Earth yeah. different than the way we've been doing it. And, and if we don't do this, the writing's already on the wall. It's like, okay, kiss her goodbye. It's gone. And yet, I, I'm very optimistic. Right. But because... you're, saying, you're saying this is actually a good thing. What's happening right now is a great news because this allows the evolution. Without this breaking point, without everything collapsing, something new Absolutely. is not possible. Tell us about that because in nature, we see it all the time, don't we? But, well, nature nature makes a plan, and, and when things go smoothly, it stays stable forever. And if things don't go smoothly, nature says, okay, that didn't work, and then eliminates it. So when you look over the history of life on this planet, there are species that show up, and then they disappear, and then they come back, and this applies to human civilization. So uh, the concept of a Lemuria, the concept of Atlantis uh, is definitely back there. I mean... We, we have a very limited vision that we think, oh, humans just got here. <laughs> oh, that history is only the last 5,000 years. And it's sort of like, look, the Sphinx and the pyramids are 50,000 years old, man. There was something happening for 40,000 years to build those things yeah. that we don't even know about. Yeah. So uh, the fact is we have to start awakening to who we are, what we are, and how powerful we are in creating a world and i think this is the biggest wake-up call mm -hmm. it, is for us to recognize that we are powerful beyond our own imagination so powerful and yet our belief system is that we are weak and frail and vulnerable yeah since, since biology is based on belief if you believe you're weak and frail, then that's what you become. <laughs> yeah, 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 because that's what you say is that it's not dependable on our genes and our DNA. You're saying actually the memory is in the cell and we have a choice in the matter by our thoughts, our way we're thinking and how we're behaving. There's there's a huge shift there that has been, that's going on, that is happening. This, this is an evolutionary shift because it, understand biology is based on the, the new understanding is our perceptions of our reality control our biology. So when we perceive we're frail and weak, yeah. that's what we are. If we, and so here's what the upheaval is in science that this is the evolutionary jump. And it goes like this. We have been programmed to believe that genes control our lives and our traits. Yeah. This becomes relevant because, and I say, uh, Lilu, did, did you uh, pick the genes you came with on this planet? And you go, well, I don't know. Maybe I did. I don't know. I don't know. I say, well, if you don't like the genes that you have and you want some different traits, can you change your traits? And the answer is no. So as far as we know, we didn't pick the genes. We can't change the genes. And then we believe the genes control who we are. Well, that means we're victims yeah. and we've been programmed to be victims saying, look, your life is not in your control. It's in your genes. And I'm going to be the medical, uh, you know, organization and we take care of you because you can't take care of you. Mm -hmm. And so we have become victimized by our own belief that we are frail. The new science, which the old science was called genetic control, which simply means control by genes. The new science is called epigenetic control. You see, uh, epi is in three little, three little letters. Uh, you know, it's like, what's the difference? I say, epi means above. So when I say epigenetic control, the new science is saying control above the genes. And once you start to write, wait, what's the control above the genes? I say, your perceptions your beliefs, your life experiences, all of these change your biology and your genetics. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's why if you perceive you're a victim, and since it's based on perception, you become the victim. And yet the new biology says, wait, you control your genetics by the way you respond to the world. 
And when we start to learn to live in harmony with the world, then our cells and our biology will live in harmony with us. And so this is the lesson is like, our inner sicknesses are actually complements to the world that we create externally. Mm. So when we create a more harmonious world, then our biology will be more harmonious as well. Mm. So where is the starting point? What is the choice that we have to make? What can we do on a practical level, all of us at this point in time? <laughs> well, the first thing is to get new awareness because knowledge is power. Yeah. When you have a lack of knowledge, just by definition, that means a lack of power. If you don't know who you are and you buy into the victim, then you have completely disempowered yourself. So the first thing is to really gain, who am I? Well, listen, I got into this whole business because uh, I didn't believe in spirituality. And there's science and spirituality. Those are the two like opposing forces most of the time. Yeah. I say, well, if I don't believe in spirituality, then my truths have to come from science. So I go, I let go of that whole spiritual stuff and I get into the science. When I started to get into the new biology, which is epigenetics, and how the information from the environment is translated to our genetics, I learned something very important uh, about that each human is different. There are no two humans that are exactly the same. And I can't exchange my cells with any other human and no other human can put their cells in my body because we say, oh, my immune system will determine it as not self. I said, oh, I have a self. Lilo has a self. Everyone has their own self. I said, where is that self that makes us each different from each other? And that's when I started to put together the information that on the surfaces of our cells, which is like our own skin, uh, a cell, very simple fact, a cell is like a miniature human. Mm -hmm. Meaning every function that you can look at in my whole human body, uh, and you tell me a function, digestion, respiration, muscle system, skeletal system, nervous system. I say, I can show it to you in, in the cell, that every cell has every one of those functions. Why? Because if I'm a human, I'm made out of cells. If anything I do as a human, I must do it because my cells did it. So cells are miniature humans in every degree. And the brain of the cell turns out not to be the genes like what says in the textbook, because the genes are reproduction. The nucleus of the cell with all the genes is not the brain of the cell, it's the gonad of the cell, it's reproduction. And, and it's funny, I always joke about it in my lecture because I always say, well, science is a male dominated profession, you know? And that since they think with their gonads and making the brain of the cell the gonad made sense at that time. Uh, but the, the simple reality is that the brain is from the skin and the cell's brain is the membrane, the skin. And it's interesting because you say, well, does that mean my brain is for my skin? The answer is absolutely. If you understand embryology, the skin, derivatives of the skin form the nervous system. So the skin is the nervous system, okay? On the skin of the cell, there are receptors. Like on our skin, we have eyes and ears and nose, taste, all these sensory receptors, and I say, a cell is a miniature human. It's got all of its sensory receptors on its skin, but it's got one extra set of receptors called self receptors. That's actually the name in medicine, self receptors, receivers of self. I go, oh, where are these receptors? They're like eyes, ears, and I said, where are they? Well, on the surface of the cell are these little like television antennas that stick up and they read the environment. Each one of us has a different set of antennas. And I say, oh, the antennas make us different. I go, no, no, the antennas receive a signal. It's not the antennas like watching a television set and you have a, like in the old days with an aerial on the roof. You say, oh, the television show is in the aerial. I go, no, 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 the television show is picked up by the aerial and then played into the television set. So I say, oh, our personal identities that make each one of us different from each other is nothing inside the cell. It's due to a set of antennas like receptors, like eyes that are reading the universe. And each of us has a different set of these antennas. And so what got to me is, oh my God, 
my personal identity, your personal identity is not inside your body. It's something out here that's being picked up by the antennas. Mm -hmm. and, and this blew my mind because basically said, so wait, my identity is not inside here. My identity is out here. Mm -hmm. uh, each of us is like a, a biological television set. Mm -hmm. My antennas are playing the Bruce show right now. Your your beautiful antenna is playing Lilu show right now, okay? And I go, um, but like a television set, if the picture tube breaks on the television, you say, oh, the television is dead. I go, the television is dead, but the question is, did the broadcast die? Mm. You say, well, you get another TV and put a set of antennas on there and tune it to the station, and the, and the show is back on the air. And I go. Our identity is a broadcast coming in through these antennas called self receptors. That if I die, that's the television dying. But did the broadcast die? No. Broadcast still out there in the field. It's still there. How would I know? And the answer is get another embryo with the same set of antennas that are on my cells right now. If another embryo comes with the same antennas, it's going to play the Bruce show again. <laughs> but what's neat is. Is it is my television a male or a female? It's like, that's the television set. That's not the broadcast. I say, well, there's a white or black. Because that's a television set. It's not the broadcast. Yeah. And so here I go from not believing spirituality, getting into science and saying, okay, this is how it works. And finally science saying, wait, but my identity is not inside here. It's out here, which takes me right back over to, oh, my God we're spiritual entities <laughs> and it was like in quantum physics to make it you know so people that are nervous about the word spirituality mm -hmm. uh quantum physics talks about the invisible energy fields as shaping the physical realm uh, einstein said simply the field which is the invisible forces of quantum physics the field is the sole governing agency of the particle the particle is the physical body so quantum physicists say that the physical body or physical particles are a reflection of the invisible field. Mm. Well, it's like, wait, wait, what's the definition of the field for quantum physicists? I go, the definition of the field is an invisible moving force that influences the physical world. I go, hmm, that's the same definition of spiritualists use about spirit. Spirit is an invisible moving force that influences the physical world. I go, Quantum physics and our ancient belief in spirituality are coming together. And this is the other part of the evolutionary understanding. Not only are we uh, genetic uh, mechanisms that we can control the genetics with our thought, but then our personal identity turns out not even to be in here, it's out here. Mm -hmm. And if we all knew this as knowledge, then we would treat each other quite differently on this planet to recognize that uh, we, you know, we're, we're here for, for this very special experience. And the, the joke for me was funny, is that um, uh, when I, I first understood, oh my God, there's a spiritual me outside and then a physical me. Mm -hmm. and, and I own this spirituality because of the physics at that moment. And I go, why have both? Why have a spiritual body and a physical body? Why, why not just be spiritual? And and when I asked that question to myself, it's funny because my cells, I could feel the answer coming up from mm. myself. And the answer, the, uh, uh, the answer was in the form of a question. It was funny. I asked, why have both? And my cells said, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my goodness, this physical body made out of these cells converts the physical world of sight and sound and smell and taste and touch and love and pain and whatever all these things that we feel come from the cells. So the idea is when we come into a body, it's like stepping into a virtual reality suit that I could smell and taste and feel and experience the planet. And I was like, oh my God, we're here on this delightful experience to live in this beautiful garden. 
Now, the unfortunate part is we destroyed the garden, found ourselves to be victims of our genetics and our chemistry, look at war as a way of life because Darwinian evolution said that struggle is the whole evolution. And it's like, no wonder we're in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and if you, everybody understood the nature of who we are and why we are here, then they'll understand the most wonderful secret that I came across in my own life because I never believed in it. Earth is actually heaven. <laughs> it's where we come to create and fulfill desires and dreams and imagination. It's where we come to experience sensation. Yes, some things hurt, and yet some things feel great. Some things are love, some things are fear. And the whole idea is the, you have an opportunity to land on this planet, step into this suit, create your reality from your imagination, experience all of this stuff, and then when you die, you, go, you leave the suit, but you're still there, but when you're out of the suit, all of this physical stuff is not accessible anymore. You have to come back into the suit again. So many people look at this planet and say, oh my God, I can't wait to get out of this place. And I'm thinking, no, no, you don't understand. This was the place to be. <laughs> yeah. This this is where all the action is. And um, as I said, uh, uh, if you're just a spirit, you can't see what a, a sunset looks like. If you're just a spirit, you can't have a feeling called love because love is the chemistry of the body creating uh, an energy signal that goes back to our source. And so people have taken heaven, bought other people's stories, made belief out of them. Instead of believing in their wishes and their desires, they bought the other people's story, which the other ones were disempowering. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And so basically, we've come to heaven and created other people's vision. And guess what? We turned it into hell. It's like, oh my God, when do we change it? Yeah. And how do we change it? How do we liberate this, the memory cells or those limiting beliefs? Okay. Uh, well, the whole idea is this the research really reveals that the, remember I said the cell membrane is the skin of the cell. And it's the interface between the external environment and the biology inside the genes and the behavior. So the skin reads the environment and adjusts the biology. Well, here's an interesting fact is that uh, when we create a human with trillions of cells, the cells still have to read the environment and adjust their biology, otherwise they won't survive. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, in a trillion cell organism like a human, I have a special thing called the brain and the nervous system whose job is to read the environment and then adjust this 50 trillion cells that are behaving in their genetics to fit in the environment. So the nervous system, part of the skin, is to read the environment and, and, and tell the cells. Well, the problem is we put a, a mind somewhere between the environment and the cells. We've got this mind. Yeah. Well, the yeah. mind is, there's two parts to the mind. There's the conscious mind, which is connected to our spirit and our source and our identity. And there's the subconscious mind, which is the equivalent of a, a record playback, like a tape recorder. Mm -hmm. It records experiences that we repeat over and over again. So that it there, huh? all this part. What's that? All this, Th this part. Yeah, all, all, all of this part. <laughs> But only this little part right here in the front, this little piece right in front of your forehead, right there, that part is where the conscious part is. The rest of the whole thing is subconscious. Yeah. Okay, so here's the problem. The mind interprets the environment and the mind sends the signals to the cell and then the cell adjusts the genetics and the behavior to fit the perception. And then I say, yeah, well, here's the problem. Uh, that our mind, the conscious mind, is the one connected to our spirit. It has our wishes, our desires, uh, our, what we want from life. I, if I ask you legally, I say, tell me, tell me what you want out of your life. I know the answer is going to come from this little conscious part. Then you're going to tell me all your wishes. And I go, yeah, but how come 
if we're creating our lives that I don't see all my wishes manifest out here. I have great, I have better wishes than I'm experiencing. What's wrong? And here comes the issue. And if we understand this, this is the breakthrough. And it goes like this. The conscious mind, which is creative and has your personal identity, also has the ability to travel. The conscious, I could say, Lila, what are you doing next week? And, and you could create a vision in the future. I say, what did you do last week, last Monday? And then you go back and you think, okay, I went back to my mind. I went to the past. I go, oh, no, okay. While you're sitting here, I want you to do the square root of two and tell me what that number is. And at some point I'll see that, well, you're not paying attention now. Your mind is going up and trying to solve mathematics up here somewhere. What's the point? The conscious mind travels. It's not staying present. Uh-huh. And, and so I say, yeah, but then if, if your mind is not paying attention, then what's paying attention? I go, the subconscious mind. Uh-huh. The subconscious mind runs the show 95% of the time. Meaning 95% of the time, my mind is not paying attention to what's going on. And as a result, as my conscious mind's going all over the place, I need the subconscious mind, like the robot mind, to take care of everything. And, and the issue about it is when I'm using the subconscious mind, I'm using it because I'm not paying attention, which means when the subconscious mind's playing its programs, I don't see it because my mind wasn't paying attention. I'll give an example. Um, when you first learned how to drive a car, you didn't have a memory of how to drive a car. You had to practice and practice. Well, practicing driving the car creates a habit. So driving the car, you don't have to pay attention with your conscious mind. After you drive the car a long time, you can do it unconsciously. If you just drive down the street. So I say, okay, look, you get a passenger in the car with you. And you go down the street and you get involved with a discussion. I said, well, the conversation you're carrying out with your conscious mind. So your conscious mind is not paying attention to the road. It's talking to, to the passenger. And I go, yeah, but you could drive 10 minutes maybe. And then at some point, look out the window and go, I haven't paid attention to the road for 10 minutes. I've been in a conversation. I said, well, you didn't hit anything. <laughs> you're still doing good. Mm. I said, who drove the car? not the conscious mind it was in the discussion the subconscious mind and it's a million times more powerful as a computer than the conscious mind so it's a million times more powerful driving the car than your conscious mind okay well here's the issue you just drive 10 minutes you've been in a conversation you look out the window and you realize i haven't paid attention to the road for 10 minutes and i get okay look can you tell me what your conversation was all about you go, yeah, because my conscious mind, I can tell you, you know, I was there in the conversation. I say, can you tell me what happened on the road for the last 10 minutes? The answer is, I, I didn't pay attention. I was in the conversation. <laughs> I go, that's the point. <laughs> All of our things from driving a car to doing the job at work to talking to somebody can be carried out by the automatic programs in the subconscious mind. But the conscious mind will only know what it was focusing on. So if I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing, then the behavior I'm using is not from my creative mind, it's from my subconscious mind. Okay, now here is the last piece of this. Mm -hmm. The first six years of your life, your brain is in a record state to download information in the subconscious mind. And it's recording behavior not from you, it's observing your parents. It's observing your family. It's observing your community. So as a kid, the first six years of your life, you are being hypnotized by observing everybody else. So the subconscious programs, the, the fundamental subconscious programs, are not even yours. You downloaded them from watching other people. So your own subconscious mind is playing programs that you copied from other people. They're not even your programs. They're not your wishes. They're not your desires. They're other people's belief systems. This is not new. <laughs> the Jesuits for 500 years would say, give me the child and I will show you the man. Mm -hmm. Or they would say, give me a child until it's six or seven and it will belong to the church for the rest of its life. Mm -hmm. What did they know? They knew that if I get the first six years of your program, 
that's the basic programs in your subconscious mind that the rest of your life 95 percent of your life is going to come from that subconscious so whatever i put in the first six years i don't care what your wishes and desires are because your life 95 percent is going to come from those programs so your life today is really a reflection of your wishes and desires five percent of the time and your subconscious programs 95 percent of the time and if the fundamental subconscious programs came from other people then you're not creating your wishes and desires you're creating what the program is yeah. and then you go back over the program and psychologists will tell you this 70 percent or more of the programs are negative and redundant and self-sabotaging and so if 75 70 percent of our programs that we downloaded are negative and we're playing them 95 percent of the time guess what that's why our lives never really look like what we wish and desire it's not because we're not creating what our lives it's just that our wishes and desires are only working five percent of the time and, and then you say oh well wait a minute so I'm creating my beliefs that other people gave me. I go, yeah, so it's not your life anymore. It's what you've been programmed. Mm -hmm. And we've generally all been disempowered with the programming of, oh, we're frail, we're vulnerable, viruses will get us, don't eat sugar, we're gonna die, all these kinds of things like that. It's like, that's not true. Uh, and, and then it, here comes, the, this is the understanding. What if you, made the programs of your conscious mind the programs of your recorded subconscious behavior so that your subconscious when you're not when your conscious is not paying attention will still play the same programs that were in your conscious mind then you'd be creating your life and they say well Bruce you talk about my mind creating my life and 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 i look at my life and i go yes my my life doesn't match what's in my mind i go yeah that's because you're playing the 95 percent subconscious and then you go i need some give me some better proof of what i can map what can I manifest and then i go okay go back in your life go back to a time when you fell head over heels in love with somebody where that big love where you you were living that what I call the honeymoon effect. I said, what's the honeymoon effect? I said, go back to that time in your life where you fell big time in love with somebody. I go, were you healthy at that time? Almost everybody go, yeah, I was exuberantly healthy. Mm -hmm. I go, did you have energy? They go, oh, we had so much energy. We made love for days without stopping for food. We had so much energy and I go, okay, was life so wonderful in that honeymoon that it would that you couldn't wait for the next day because it was so beautiful to be here and you go yeah yeah it was great and I go would that be sort of like um living in heaven did you create heaven in other words that wasn't an accident that honeymoon that was something you did I said I lived in that moment and I created harmony and beauty and health and energy and everything was so great and I said was heaven on earth the answer is yes I said so what was unique about the honeymoon and here's what's so important that wasn't an accident that was a creation you created heaven on earth during what is called the honeymoon and I said well how did you do that all of a sudden you, your life may have been crap right up to that moment and then from that moment on it was beautiful i said what happened and here's the answer when we're in love the conscious mind stays in the present moment because it doesn't want to travel it's already got everything wants right here why does the conscious <laughs> want to leave yes, guess yes. what when you stay in the conscious mind then you're creating a life of your wishes and desires and what you want and I said, well, that honeymoon is great, but then somehow or other that honeymoon disappears. It's not the same. Mm -hmm. I go, what happened? And here's the, the fun part. Because the honeymoon part was I had to keep my conscious mind present at, the, at this moment to stay in this love state. But then I said, but life still goes on. Life gets busy. You've got to pay the rent. You've got to fix the car. you got so many things going on in your mind. I say, what happens? Well, at some point, your conscious mind 
doesn't stay present. It starts to travel saying, oh, I got to take care of this at work and I have to fix this and I'm solving things in my head. And then your loving partner, which you've had this honeymoon effect with, asks you something uh, very simple and, and your mind is not there. You're at, and when you make a response, it's coming from the subconscious. I go, yeah, but what, com- what response am I coming from the subconscious? I said, well, in my case, as a male, I watched my father and I downloaded his behavior. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, I get my partner who's been loving and we had this great honeymoon comes up and asks me a simple question. And my mind's not there because I'm thinking about something. I turn around and I make a response the way my father did. And my partner looks at me like, what kind of behavior is that? Who are you? I haven't, I haven't seen this person. Yeah. And, and now here comes the joke. Because I just said something I didn't even hear. Why? Because I did it with my subconscious mind. Did I even, was I aware of what I said? The answer, no, because my conscious mind was thinking. And I played the tape automatically. Did I see what I was doing? It's like driving the car. I didn't see what happened. But then it's like, now I've been accused of being somebody else. And it's like, oh, I've always been me. I'm the same person. I know what you're talking about. The fact is, the honeymoon ends. Because it, the honeymoon started with two conscious minds with both wishes and desires and, and, and aspirations for life. Both of them creating in that consciousness the love that they both wanted. Mm-hmm. But when life gets busy and the conscious mind starts to disappear, thinking and stuff like that, then the habit programs that I run are not mine, they're my father's. Mm-hmm. Well, the issue about that, the honeymoon worked when two conscious minds were together in the relationship, and the honeymoon ends when four minds show up, the two conscious minds and the two subconscious minds with completely different programs. And the honeymoon ends because now you have to compromise to accept the other person's behavior which isn't theirs but it was downloaded from their parents and say well the relationship was really good when we were being conscious and then it goes really crazy when we're not conscious and how long's the honeymoon effect last how long's a relationship last and the answer is how much can you accept of the other person's unconscious mind programs that will stretch you because you'll have to compromise some of the things that you thought were important. Uh, uh, you know, like uh, somebody could be verbally abusive in their subconscious mind. And when they're not in their subconscious mind, everything is heaven on earth. And then they get in their subconscious mind and all of a sudden they get to the, be very abusive. And the, the recipient has to go, do I want to put up with that? <laughs> and now I have to balance out, well, I really like the part where they're here and conscious, but I don't really like that part. And then you have to say, well, that's what determines whether the relationship is going to be made or break or what's going to go on is how much you can accept of the unconscious behavior. And so or, the honeymoon- or is it that, or is it that it's, it's, it's the heart, as you were explaining, and being in the present moment and, and really keeping on entertaining that love that will keep on creating, a, of course, a relationship of ease and grace and magic, but, yeah. you know, how can we stay with that open heart, with that, how can right. we stay there? For that ease okay. and grace to take place every day in every aspect of our life. Okay, so here's the important thing. If we are operating 95% of our life from our subconscious programs, then look at your life because it represents a printout of your subconscious programs. You're only contributing 5% from your conscious mind, so your life is 95% a printout. So what does it mean? It says, well, what's in my subconscious mind? I go, look, you weren't there for the first six years when it was being programmed, so you really don't know what was in there. But I can tell you what, you can know what's in there by looking at your life. Why? The things that work for you that are easy and that you really like are supported because your subconscious agrees with you having those things. Anything you struggle with, anything you have to work on, anything that becomes an effort means you're going against a program that does not support that. So basically it says all you have to do is look at your life and say, Anything I'm struggling with, I have a program in my subconscious mind that doesn't support that. 
you can go back and rewrite the subconscious programs. And why is that relevant? Because if I take all the ones that aren't working right and reinstall programs that give me the better output, the what I would like to have, then that, guess what? If you take the beliefs and wishes from your conscious mind and put them as programs in your subconscious mind, then that means, think about it, 95% of the day when you're not paying attention, you're still playing the honeymoon programs. That means if you put in your wishes and desires in your subconscious mind, then you don't even have to be conscious of it. You will always be in the honeymoon program because you will automatically continue playing the honeymoon. So if that's true, which it is, then the relevance is, what if you created a mindset that this is heaven? What if this whole place is heaven? That everybody is here to create and not to interfere with each other and allow the expression and the, and the activity and the reception of all those emotions and feelings and love and all that. If we could all do that with our common wishes and desires and let go of the negative beliefs, then this actually turns out to be the heaven that I already know it is. But it will be experienced by more and more people. And when more and more people do this, we'll start living in love rather than living in the material realm, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is what has been destroying the planet. Yeah. Because we put the physical realm mm -hmm. over the spiritual realm in our current conventional science that we look at, oh, spiritual stuff, that's religion, that's metaphysical. And they're like, oh, no, the physical stuff is, this is what life is all about. And they go, not really. When you understand quantum physics, it's the invisible stuff that is more important. Love is more important than uh, a Ferrari. <laughs> yeah. Why did you get the Ferrari? Oh, because someone will love me if I have the Ferrari. It's like, look, why don't you just go for the love without the Ferrari? You could get that. And, and this is what we have to learn is that the love that we want and experience is more priority to our survival than any of the material possessions we have. Love, if you're in full love, you don't even really need food, <laughs> to tell you the truth, yeah. because we're so evolutionarily advanced. Yeah. But the significance about that is we've been programmed not to see love, uh, it's something elusive, you can't get there from here, that you should look out for the fear, what's gonna scare you, who's gonna hurt you. And so all of a sudden, since our perceptions create a reality, we're, we're not perceiving heaven. We're saying, I, I want to get out of this hell so I can go to heaven. It's like, you, this was heaven. You just created hell out of it. That was a choice. That was a choice. Because if you change your subconscious programmings, then you, guess what? Then it's heaven all the time. Mm -hmm. It's heaven all the time. So you, so you are saying we're, we're becoming the new species, species, even. Yes, yes. Through the opening through of the heart, really. The heart. Through living through in the place of love, so unconditional love, love, which is not even exactly the kind of love that we, most of us, know. Yes, this is exactly what we have to learn, because we have to recognize that all of us are cells in the same body. If you terrorize a single cell in your body, then you're terrorizing yourself. And we have to start recognizing that you and I and we are all this one thing. And if we become self-destructive in the outer world, the the complementarity occurs in the inner world. That's why most of our illnesses today are, are autoimmune, self-destructive illnesses. We're destroying each other on the outside. We're destroying ourselves on the inside. Same vibration. Yeah. Same vibration. Um, um, I've interviewed recently Dr. Wayne Dyer in Maui yes. that has received healing from John of God in over in Brazil. Uh, uh, miraculous uh, healing. I've interviewed uh, numbers of people that went through near-death experiences. Uh, just absolutely, absolutely astonishing. 24-hour uh, turnaround. Miraculous. How do you explain that? <laughs> because every cell as I described in the biology of belief, that cell membrane, that skin, is actually the equivalent of a, of a programmable computer chip. And the nucleus with the genes is like a hard drive with programs in it. Mm -hmm. 
we used to think that the gene programs are like read-only memory. So whatever the gene is, that's what you are. But the new science of epigenetics says that the, uh, the cell is like a computer chip and the nucleus is read-write, meaning I can change the output of my hard drive by my response to the environment. Okay, so this becomes a, a, a new understanding about um, if we change our belief system, we change the chemistry in our body and it's the chemicals that there are the switches for our genes, okay? So um, basically what it really comes down to is that the cell is programmable and it's programmed by our beliefs. And it's the same as a computer. You can type the, on the surface the little receptors that I talked about, those antennas that are sticking up on the surface. They're like keys on a keyboard. Each, each receptor responds to a different signal. And when we send different signals, we type on the surface of the cell. As fast as you can type on the surface of the cell, you can change the genetic readout, just like writing. Uh, you have a program on your desktop. You start typing into that. Uh, you can change the program. We can do the, the cells are programmable and they're programmed by our perceptions. The moment you change your perception is the moment you rewrite the chemistry of your body. So <clears throat> this is where the whole secret of the control of the cells comes down to. And it's uh, it's very simple, actually. I'll just take two minutes to explain it because it's like, ah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. what? What was the experiment that changed my life back in 1967? I cloned stem cells, meaning I took one stem cell, put it in a petri dish all by itself, and then every 10 hours it divides. So first there's one stem cell, then there's two and four and eight, 16, 32, and every 10 hours it's doubling. So after about two weeks, I got thousands of cells in the petri dish, and they're all genetically identical because they came from the same parent. Now I split the cells up into three different Petri dishes, so genetically identical cells in three dishes. But I changed the chemical environment, the growth medium, the chemistry, I just changed a little bit. And so in one dish, the cells form muscle, and in another dish with a different chemistry, they form bone, and in a third dish with a different chemistry, they form fat cells. So I said, wait, what controls the fate of the cells? And the answer is not the genetics because they were all genetically the same. So the only thing that was different was the environment, the growth medium. So I go, oh, cool, if I change the chemistry of the growth medium, I control the behavior and genetics. I go, yeah. Now I go, well, that's in a plastic Petri dish. At a simple point, if I take my plastic Petri dish of cells, move it from a good environment and put it into a bad environment, the cells will get sick. And then you would say, oh, what drugs should I give the cell? And I go, no, no. Don't get to sell any drugs. Just take the dish from the bad environment, move it back in the good environment, and immediately it'll get well again. The cells reflect the environment. So I go, oh. I go, well, what about humans? I go, and here's the joke. A human is a community of 50 trillion cells. A human is a skin-covered Petri dish. I got 50 trillion cells in my dish, whether it's a skin dish or a plastic dish. It's still whatever the growth medium is that controls the fate of the cells. If I take my plastic dish from a good environment to a bad environment, the cells get sick. I say, you want to make them well? No drugs. Move them back to the good environment. I say, my skin covered Petri dish. Me. I move me from the good environment to a bad environment. You say, oh, shit. You want to make them well? Yeah. Move them back to the good environment. No drugs. That's all the cells. So the blood in your body is the culture medium. And I feed 50 trillion cells with this blood. And this has all the chemistry. And I go, what controls the chemistry? Because the chemistry of the culture medium determines the cells' fate. I go, ah, oh, the brain. The brain releases chemicals into the blood based on my perceptions. So... <clears throat> If I see someone I love, I release wonderful chemicals in my body like dopamine and oxytocin, pleasure and bonding chemicals. I release growth hormone and serotonin. These are chemicals that give healthy responses to the cells. That's why 
when you fall in love in that honeymoon response? First thing is you're usually extremely healthy. Why? Because the chemicals released into your blood from a love vision are chemicals of nurturing and support for the cells and health and you grow beautifully and you get lots of energy. But if I open my eyes and look around and I'm afraid of the world, I release stress hormones. Well, they're completely different chemistry than love hormones. In stress hormones, I shut down the system to protect myself. And the more stress I perceive, the more I shut myself down. The deeper I get away from the world, blocking it off. And the fact is, yeah, but growth is based on communicating with the world, taking things in and exchanging with the world. And protection is based on closing it off. Protection. I go, well, you can't be in growth and protection at the same time. One is open, one's closed. It's like, that's the issue. I change the chemistry with my thoughts. As much as fast as I change the chemistry, the culture medium, my blood, the chemistry affects the genetics and the behavior. So you can have a spontaneous remission just by changing the belief system right, and changing right. the chemistry. But in the, in the case of, uh, so, uh, let's say, an induced it. one or, or an experience that kind of happened to us, not that not there's such a thing, so, apparently, but right, that, that, you know, we're, we're, we're it's kind of coming it's kind to of, us. So it's, it's not something, not, that, something that we've worked on. I didn't understand that, Lilo. I mean, <clears throat> um, because um, I, I, I've been in contact, I've interviewed some doctors that do some induced after death communication, that uh, there's or near death experiences like that. So, within, yeah. so it seems like it's, it's, it's an immediate change of thought. I mean, it's an immediate and very quick and fast uh, happening there. Spontaneous evolution, uh, spontaneous remission. Yeah is yeah. by definition spontaneous yeah how yeah. fast how fast can you change the program on your computer yeah. how fast can you type in a new belief system and change it and as little as you will resist. will resist as fast as you can change your thought is how fast you change your biology and so it's like giving power back to say look what's happening in your body is not an accident What's happening in your body is being programmed. There's a director up here who's reading the world, interpreting the world, sending chemicals to the body, and the chemicals are converted into biology. You want to change your biology, change the way you see the world, and the chemistry will change immediately. That's how you could be thinking the world is hell, and then you meet this wonderful person, fall head over heels in love. One day the world is hell, the next day it's heaven. <laughs> How fast is that? The answer is how fast you change your perception. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, well this it's was great. such an awesome uh, conversation, very juicy as I like to call it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's exciting because after years and years of perceiving ourselves as victims of the world and, and victims of things that are out of our control, the truth is coming around that we are so powerful that we can change our biology and genetics the moment we just change our thoughts. We can change the world around us from the hell that we believe in to the heaven we desire. Mm -hmm. And if you do that and rewrite your subconscious programs, then you have a whole new life on this planet, completely different. And so it's like, we don't have to wait a thousand years for evolution. Evolution can happen this afternoon. <laughs> it's, it's a matter of how much and how fast you want to change your belief system. But the first thing is this. We are not victims of anything more than our belief. You change that belief, you change the world we live in. And you know what? Thousands of years of prophets and seers and ancient you know, wisdom providers have all said exactly the same thing but it now it's coming into the world of science and when it becomes in the world of science and it becomes public domain except it's interesting because the science i'm talking about is more in the academic ivory tower than it is in the in the conventional world the reason is this the media is not really supporting this this new evolutionary belief because it undermines the corporate entities that have taken advantage of, of that belief by controlling our beliefs. We buy what they say, we do what they do, we create the war when they say create the war. It's like, 
Yeah, of course the media doesn't want you to know how powerful you are because then you create your life. And that's what this evolution is all about. It is the most empowering time for humans ever on this planet to take back the power of who we really are. 